I had never seen this movie. Yes. Oh my uh, god. So because Howard the Duck was a big part of the last episode of What If, I'm like, uh huh. Hey guys, can we watch this movie? And I think we had talked about doing all their movies anyways, like yeah, uh, properties and stuff, and revisiting because Josh wasn't gonna be here. I didn't want to do anything from the '90s, like yeah. the the Phantom or the, uh, the Shadow, the Shadow or something like that, because I know those are things he really likes, especially after watching a Rocketeer episode. Mm-hmm. So I was like, well, let's do one that is uh, as old as I am. Uh, and old w- what's Howard the Duck? Because it came out 35 years ago. Created the same, the, created the same day, the same year. Um, so here's me. This is this is young Clay, uh, a Howard the Duck fan all the way back then. Hey, I uh heard this howard the duck movie was coming out so this became one of my first collections i collected all the individual comics and all the magazine issues which are two totally different things and uh tried to consume them all i had read the novelization of this and thought okay this is what comedy is and i'm gonna go see this movie and this is gonna be comedy too like what i'm reading and it is two totally different things (laughs) but i've loved howard the duck since i was a kid uh, just mainly because it got me collecting, finding out more, digging deeper, uh, the fun part of comics, questing for books and things like that. And I pretty much have all that stuff still. <laughs> I, I don't have the Howard the Duck poster, which I'm kind of bummed about. I need to see if I can track down a real movie poster from that time. Yeah, but you have the vinyl. You have the vinyl now. I have How, the vinyl. Where did you get the vinyl from? Uh, half Fresh Books. <laughs> oh, you bastard. You <laughs> but I have... Bitch. But the cassette I have of the music, the cassette I have, I bought back then. So I That's had fine. that one the whole. I time. still have my original Transformers the movie soundtrack that I got from a contest when they released in the th- you know in the theater. But it's still you have, you have oh, I don't have, and I I have the I have Transformers the movie on uh, two different vinyls, old, new, and cassette tape. But I don't have How the Duck. <laughs> <laughs> See now now I know there's also a VHS and a laser disc. I need to hunt down. That's what I was going to ask if there's a laser disc because I have a DVD. Up on- that came there up is a laser Friday. disc. Yeah. Um, so for those that don't know, because well, unlike this movie, I want to credit both creators. Uh, <laughs> uh, Howard the Duck uh, was created by Steve Gerber and Val Mayrick, who's a local to Texas. Oh. Um, the really cool dude at conventions when I've met him. Uh, and he appears. Wait, is he first, a writer or artist? He's an artist. artist. I, he did both now, but. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, no, but this he, just means but, to look for him for a sketch. But Merrick, <laughs> Merrick was the artist. Although, with the Marvel method, a lot of the artists are really writers, too. Yeah. Um, so, uh, he first appeared in Adventure into Fear number 19, which is which was a man thing story, mm-hmm. I believe, right? Yeah. He was at uh, the nexus of all reality, so he drew in, of course, like other characters, and here's where Howard, Howard the Duck pops up. Yeah. Um, so. Why don't, why don't you guys tell us a little bit about the character first, and then we'll jump into the movie. He's a duck uh, from Duck World. That's all you need. Uh, he's, <laughs> he's a duck from Duck World that uh, was and pulled, is a master of quack foo. <laughs> master of quack foo. He was pulled through the nexus of all reality to get to Earth six one six, and that's how he has his adventures with Marvel characters. Um, he is pulled through the nexus in the movie by some sort of beam or science. Like a laser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, yeah, he's in his recliner. What the hell's happening? Ah! And, <laughs> I think I don't know if so. I, I haven't read many of the older things, but Howard's been pretty usually like uh, kind of meta, like doing maybe Deadpool things before Deadpool yeah. was doing Deadpool things, sort of. Yeah, so Steve Gerber would write kind of satire he would parrot you know he would kind of write about like hippies and and or specific people and and you know joke about that personality uh like you know dr bong is based on a character or based on a real person Dr. Bong. Uh, yeah so like he has these things in there that he would create and it was always just kind of a funny book and uh that's where george lucas discovered him was uh through the gerber writings and so he had taken it to uh 
Gloria Katz and uh, who's the writer on this? Willard Huck. George Lucas is an old friend. I had gone to film school with him and uh, Gloria Katz, my wife slash writing partner, and I had uh, written American Graffiti with him. So, you know, we felt very comfortable and uh, this was an, another collaboration. After American Graffiti, George had said that he had found this comic book about a duck from outer space that lands in Cleveland. And he said it was, it was just, he thought it was very funny. And he thought it was, it was kind of very film noir with this absurdist element. Who's also the with, director, when they, right? Yeah, he was also <laughs> the director. And they were in <laughs> film school together. Does Lucas want to forget this as much as he does this Star Wars Christmas special? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. I think this one's a little more beloved. The The thing is, is those are the three people responsible for it being the way it is. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. it is... It was initially sold as a as a cartoon, and then they said, "Well, a cartoon's going to take five years to make. We need something this summer." So George Lucas says, "I can do live action. I can do all the special effects and committed ILM to everything." And if you watch any of the behind the scenes, <laughs> that's what's great because the ILM uh, the the duck suit is just falling apart. Oh, I know, I know. Look at this wonderful exhibit. It's so lifelike and realistic. Bug off. The other thing that we had talked to George for years about, should we do this live action or should we animate it? And we really wanted to animate it. But Universal needed a picture for that summer, and there's no way, you know, you need years and years to do an animated picture. So George said, well, we can build the duck, we can do it with the technology that we have. In those days, you didn't have CGI as much. So we were uh, left with using puppets and doubles in Howard the Duck costumes. So we're building various ducks and the ducks are constantly exploding or losing feathers or the proportions of the duck are wrong. And we had very, very little prep time. This does not bode well. I regret that the technology wasn't as far as it should have been and we realized that right away. The first day, I think at that time, it was really more of a puppet. It was actually somebody who had things inside of Howard. And so we're shooting, and suddenly Howard opens his mouth and his whole neck opens. And it's like the Terminator. You <laughs> see the inside of, and we're just, everybody's silent because, you know, it's a disaster. And then we thought, Oh my God, this is, this is going to take the rest of our lives. And, and that's what George said too. He said, we, we always start out with puppets. And then we think, oh God, this is horrible. Just put him in a suit. <laughs> and Howard got better. The head got better and the puppeteers were better and the little people were. We'd reshoot it. We'd say, okay, we've got half an hour. Let's do that scene where he says X. We'd put Howard back in again, put a background behind him, no matter where we were. And we were constantly reshooting, trying to get Howard to be better all the time. You know, this is beginning to seriously undermine my self-esteem. In order to cast Howard, we had essentially a person who was devoted only to going around the country to find little people and to give them essentially acting tests and tests to see how they would move. And we found a very gifted 12-year-old kid who was very, very inventive. But a child really had too much trouble with the claustrophobic nature of the suit, and it just became too difficult. So then we had the stand-in duck, which was Ed, and Ed had just a wonderful personality, would do anything possible to make something work, and so we ended up really shooting the majority of the material with him. Talk about an identity crisis. There, and then there was Ed Gale did a lot of the, of, uh, the work in the costume because he could also do stunt work. Uh, and at the time, I'm trying to remember, oh, he also played Chucky in the Chucky series. And here's what the, I have, I saw, I found an interview hey. from the, from Wait, the studio. Wait, the actor who played Chucky was Howard the Duck? Yeah. So Howard the Duck, yeah. Universal Studios had contacted me and I went in and they were pleasant, how are you, da da da. And it was more physical, it wasn't an acting audition, it was, can you jump, can you run, can you tumble? And I was very agile then and I said, well thank you, Nice, no problem, nice to see you and you're waiting for the response, and then I get a letter stating that I was too tall. I'm three feet four inches tall, and they were looking for, at that time for three foot two or under, and then called me back, 
and then they they wanted to consider me for a stunt double or understudy for a person that they had found. I was kind of like the backup, and then eventually took over the role. The I mean, boy who another yeah. problem was Universal wanted a family film. Oh and, boy, and yeah, not, and, well, um, that was not a family film. Did they and not get it? They did not get it. My, my, but they got so, a PG rating. My first, my first note on this movie. Uh, what is it going to be? I, I have a feeling. Duck tits. It's, yeah, you know, it's starting off with duck nipples and a masturbation joke. Bold move. <laughs> well, that's what they kept saying. That that was what was edgy. Like, oh, we're being edgy. We're going to put look. This this duck has a condom in his wallet. Look. Also, look. why is the condom out of the wrapper? Yeah, that was another weird thing. And why would you just, be touching I guess it? Just so you could see that it was a condom, maybe. Yeah, like that was maybe weird. you know. Yeah, very, very weird. Weird choice. <laughs> but I will say the Blu-ray uh, I have does have two documentaries on it. They're filmed fairly close together, like within two years of each other. So it's kind of the same content. But they do interviews with Leah Thompson, uh, oh, who God. says it was so interesting going from Back to the Future and skyrocketing fame to being in the biggest bomb of the eighties that became a reoccurring joke. But I've heard her actually like give credit to the film. Like, you know, it was a bomb, oh, yeah. but like, yeah, but she still gets credit. You know, for just the, what they were trying to do was, Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. She doesn't speak poorly of it. It was just, it was not for that time. And, and if you, and Shelby said, she goes, I haven't seen this uh, since I was a kid. And I go, well, watch, watch it as if it was a cartoon because that was the intent was, this was going to be a, a cartoon and all the comedy in it is slapstick. The only thing close to what Steve Gerber had written by the time this had come out was just absurdist humor. And so there's a lot of that in here, a lot of quips. <laughs> and, and, and that's the only thing close to what Steve Gerber was doing at the time. But but I, uh, I still question I still question how Tim Robbins had like they're in the museum and he brings up the little screen. It has like the evolution. Oh, dear God. Yeah, that, I, that, she they, made the film for me. That, I mean, that's I, like early childhood my, crush. My Holy favorite part shit. of the movie was definitely a Thompson. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> she said she had a complicated film history. In, in one of her movies, she was in love with her son. And in another movie, she was in love with a duck. <laughs> oh, God. I didn't think about that. Now you yeah. say that. <laughs> but Tim Robbins, they're in the museum. He brings up that screen that shows the evolution of ape into man. And just randomly has another fucking screen that has a, the evolution of a duck, duck. into a duck. I'm like... Where did you come up with this? I mean, seriously. <laughs> that was another one of my notes. I was like, wait, is that the guy from um, Shawshank? From Shawshank Redemption? Yes, yes. This is his first movie. Well, yeah. it's no, it's no wow. worse than Leah Thompson's first movie being Jaws 3D. That's true. She did have to. <laughs> Jaws 3D is really fucking bad. <laughs> I that, love that film just I because it's it. Jaws infiltrates SeaWorld. <laughs> just for that fact. <laughs> You root for Jaws. I know. I really got him. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how much history you guys looked up on Jeffrey Jones. If we want to talk about that. Uh, so as soon as he jumped on screen, I was like, I also have a note about that. Yeah. I was like, oh, no, the bad guy from Ferris Bueller. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Problem- and then I just put problematic. Problematic. Wait, wait, yeah. if he, had- he had some levity because one of my favorite lines was, you're all hairless apes. That's really disgusting. <laughs> I think <laughs> y'all hairless uh, apes. Howard Howard's dialogue was really so it, it almost feels like there's two movies to me. There's right. the first there's the first part of the movie that's yes. just a lot of fun about Howard exploring this new world yeah. and, and trying to get him back. While we also deal with the with the is it cherry bomb, the band? Is that yeah. is that what they're called? Yeah. Uh, which cherry all bomb. that stuff I man now do you want to break down who's in the band? Uh, no, who we is? can. Yeah, we can. Yeah. Well, first you got Holly Robinson. At the mm-hmm. time, from Twenty One yep. Jump Street, who would become oh, Holly Robinson? Oh, okay. If you're a big Hallmark fan, she's all over Hallmark. Yep, uh, I, I just know her from Twenty One. Liz Siegel, uh, sister of Katie Siegel. Y'all know Katie? That's uh, uh, married with children, isn't it? Yeah, Katie yeah. Siegel. Okay, and she was okay. she was also uh, the voice of uh, Leela on Futurama. Oh yeah. Well, Katie was, but but you said, Katie you was, said, yeah, yeah. But Liz, Liz is uh, the drummer in Cherry. Okay. Bones. Okay. And then there's another, the other actress I didn't know much about and didn't have much history on her. Okay. But I saw the fact that Leah Thompson actually sings the Howard the Duck song at the end. Mm-hmm. Well, she That's said that they, they put her, every day she had off, she had to train to be a singer and uh, do choreography. And so they do, uh, so she said she was constantly working to 
be able to do all the band performances. And they kept saying, we may use another singer. We may use another singer, but they did use our voice. I, I love the aesthetic of a band that has to perform behind wire fence. Yes. Well, I was like, okay. Oh. I, I'm, I'm going to say right here, Roadhouse. <laughs> I, okay, also uh, the Blues Brothers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I have seen the Blues Brothers. You're right. Uh, but I, I, I think I've seen Roadhouse too. Is that the one with the throat? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Okay, yeah. I have seen Roadhouse. <laughs> That's the one with the, the throat. throat. Um, I looked up at the beginning, but I was talking to Daniel about this. That the voiceover at the beginning, I was really curious if they had credited it as the Watcher or Utah, but the guy who introduces everyone, uh, they just call the Cosmos. But his name is Richard uh, Kylie, and he's also the voiceover uh, for the Jurassic Park tours. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah the Jurassic insane. Park movies. Yeah, he does the that's voiceover wild. on that part. Um, um and then the cinema many, oh sorry, what? I was gonna say I love how many people are credited with Howard the Duck. Yeah, because, they had a lot because, of people going because so that. many moving parts, I imagine. Uh because I think even though there was somebody wearing a suit, I imagine there's still some puppeteering and animatronics with the well it's the, no different than uh TMNT. I mean you have somebody right. in a suit, but you gotta do the electronic, you know. Yeah, so there's like yeah, but they're bad. We also had a young woman, a little person, who did stunts. And she was really sort of the stunt woman uh, doing Howard. So it was a combination of a lot of different things. And it was like the man in the Iron Mask. They had to wear this helmet. I think it was like one of the first fully self-contained animatronic suits, meaning it wasn't connected by hardwire. The motors were in the head. The cables ran up my back. I wore a battery belt, and it was all remote control. And then we had a bank, I think, of four different puppeteers who were using little joysticks. And one person was only concerned about the eyes when they blink, when they look right and left. Somebody would be doing the mouth and so forth. And it was a nightmare of coordination. I mean, they really had to know uh, and rehearse and so forth what they were doing. Sometimes we'd be shooting and the duck would just, the face would just start going ee, 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 and they'd go, a plane is going over or someone's using their garage door opener. Yeah. They had, uh, they had a lot of problems with it. And the funniest thing I saw in the documentary was the moment when they are talking in bed and Beverly kind of makes his hair stand up or his feathers stand up. <laughs> they, said, they said that trick took months, oh, months Lord. to make happen. You know and, why? They didn't go with Henson. It's fucking ILM, man. I mean, they had just done all the Star Wars series. Yeah. This is three years yeah. after Return of the Jedi. What the fuck? You can't make a duck that works? Yeah, Come they on. had some great puppets in the in the original film. Oh, uh, it's so funny. I've seen one of the puppets today and how bad it looks, and it's just all falling apart. But well, it's like looking at the old Jaws uh, shark compared Bruce. to, you know. Yeah. Well, that's because it's been dipped in the water. All this time, but the uh, director said even when they were on set, they would have they they would have everything set up. They would have the actor in the suit. They would go, and as soon as his mouth would move, it just opened up, and the whole thing just ripped open. So it just oh, looked God. like it looked like Blade Two Vampire, but then there were all these gizmos underneath uh, mm. Howard's neck, so his bill would split open when he would Ooh. try to talk. And yeah, there was a lot of puppet problems. Give me that horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> But no. yeah, Leah Thompson says there's there's multiple times where like, you know, the end of the film, they that took a month to film on set. Uh, you know, so she she just said that they were constantly behind because of the puppet. I mean, that makes sense. But it looks I mean, overall in the movie, it looks really good. Like I know it's not a real well, and also they had to have like at the beginning of the movie, I can see why they I can see why he didn't stay in Duck World. Because it would have been insane to make a <laughs> movie. Well, that was the original idea. The concept was from um, Howard the Howard the Duck magazine number six, Duck World, and I believe the story is from Bill Mantlo. And I read it last night, and it Howard finds a way to finally travel back to Duck World. Yeah, and so him and Beverly, Beverly leaves with him, and they go back to Duck World. And it's a really interesting story because a guy has developed a religion around Howard leaving and oh, the Nexus. And yeah, and he's making a lot of money. He's he's taking in all this money. And when Howard shows up, because this guy's been speaking for him, he's, he's seen as like a televangelist type. Mm. So you've got I mean, it is a hard take on religion, 
re- religious fanaticism, the, pe- the the ducks in there that kind of worship him now that he's come back. He's been across the universe, but then he's in love with a hairless, hairless ape. And they're very bothered by that. And they call it bestiality. And uh, it's, yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> What's it, the opposite of a fairy? A furry. That's what furry. it is. <laughs> And, and, you know, like when, when I said the comics and the magazines were very different, the magazines didn't have the comics code authority. So every, every issue, Beverly loses her clothes and is scantily clad. Yeah. And so that was, that was what I saw a lot in the movie uh, when they would show her dress that way. I go, they pulled all, all the adult comics and that's where they kind of well, set this, funny, but with a funny. comedic tone. Funny you mentioned that because one of my notes, and this is still from the first part of the movie, is this is the horniest version of Earth that we could put on film. <laughs> Everyone, everything in that movie is horny. Well, they were at the spa, you know. Yeah. And uh, oh my god, they had to create a suit to throw into a hot tub, and that was what that was another one I looked at when I saw them throw that in because you he, the suit gets wet a couple times. I wanted to see yep. how it held up. But yeah, they just kind of throw that in, like, look at all these people naked, having sex and making out. And this is where Howard has to work, by the way. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and then we get to the part in the movie where it kind of takes a turn into a different movie. Yeah, after, more, they're, after they're in bed together. More science. Yeah. The, <laughs> the, the they, they admit in, in Duck World that they're lovers. Oh. They admit <laughs> they're lovers in the... Con- yeah. Yeah. They're pretty good friends in this one, so I can see that. Uh, and yeah, and, and like I, after a while, I just started asking, "What the fuck is this movie?" For the second part of the movie, because I think the first part of the movie overall, I was having a good time. Yeah, it uh, changes it tone got, at that second part, definitely. It got so weird. Like then they start introducing this occult dark entity, uh, and it takes over the the body that. Uh, what's his name? That, uh, Jeffrey Jones. And, and that's how you you blame George Lucas for this because where uh, Howard kind of has a sense of supernatural events. Dark Overlord. His, Dark yeah. Overlord. Yeah. <laughs> Takes him over. Uh, uh, George Lucas said, well, we're going to switch this to sci-fi because that's what Ella, uh, ILM is stronger at. And they still use a stop motion puppet. Yeah. So so when we got to that last sequence. Uh, well, at least stop motion works. With the big monster <laughs> and the lightning. I was like, oh, this is what George Lucas wanted to make this movie. Yeah. Like that's what he's here for because he wants to make this like really you can give us Darth Vader, but you can't give us Doc uh, Doctor Bong. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I I I would love to. Well, see now that the um, I don't understand why Howard the Duck is liked so much. Yeah, I like it because it was just part of my childhood. It was this. it, It brought me into comedy and helped me understand what satire and what parody. And what slapstick and uh, different forms of comedy were because I went into this movie expecting what I was reading in these comics. And I got it in the first part with this, you know, sexy girl and this duck running around having weird adventures. But for me, it's for me, it's different because I I like it because it's a it's a cult classic, but I I like for the can't value. It's just it's Howard the Duck. It's it's no different for me than liking the the live action Master of the Universe movie. That movie is so fucking horrible too, but I still enjoy watching that just for yeah, the camp, yeah. uh, appreciation Which, of it. And a lot of the movies they had to just make changes to the story to make it to make it work as a live action movie budget wise. Yeah. Uh, but like I said, the first half of the movie, I very much enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, the second half, it's not that it was an enjoyable, it's just that it was really weird. Like the whole thing at the restaurant, which was it a soul? food sushi place yeah it, and that was always kind of a gag they would have a sight gag and then it would matter later on and like they go in and eat eggs and well, they, they and don't really they, address the joke place they spend too much time at that restaurant yes too much like that scene goes on way too long uh and then it ends up like oh uh, yeah i don't i don't know like the I, yeah the eggs i, I and was then watching they behind the them. scenes and they had that diner tilting and I was like, "Why does it? Why did it need to tilt? Why did it need to move like that? Why would you put a whole for the scene Dark Overlord? Over- yeah, that. And then the Dark Overlord so starts bad. transforming, which is weird. That, that got weird. That that I'll make. Wait, as he transforms slowly from human into whatever he's, you know, the scorpion little creature he's supposed there's, to become. That just there's also weird. too much fucking driving in this movie. Yes, they do a lot of driving. A lot of driving. I and love I'm the- sure those are cost cutting like scenes, but." Man. I love the fact that you got Tim Robbins behind Howard flying that damn little 
helicopter or whatever the thing is. I know, <laughs> just so insane. And they said that that was like the hardest thing to do. And I was like, I was like, yeah, but if you thought about this on paper and it was a cartoon, that looked like that would be fun. Yeah. But yeah. to do that live action, you should have said we should cut that out and so make it a car chase. That part I like. I like the whole airplane. Like the airplane thing was cool. It was funny. It's just really weird to see Tim Robbins in this role because of other roles that we've seen him in after. <laughs> yeah. Um and I think that's one of the things I enjoy about going back to watch movies that I've never seen. Like when people show up and I'm like, oh, wait, what was like with the Rocketeer when uh, Timothy Dalton showed up as the villain? Yeah. I was like, holy shit, it's Timothy Dalton. But it's like before he really cuts his na- like nails into the movie business. Yeah. So it's like. I don't know about that. He'd already played Bond. Yeah, he had done Bond. Yeah, I guess so. That's true. Yeah. Uh, but either way, it feels like something really out of character to be in this campy movie, which Tim Robbins is the same because. Like I said, Tim Robbins to me is like Andrew Dufresne, right? I was expecting Morgan Freeman to start narrating the the Hard Duck movie. <laughs> well, Howard from Duck World was now on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, oh shit. Yeah, I just uh, you know, and he's a weird character, and I love the weird. I mean, if if you watch the show at all, oh, like and audience, ca- when he talks about weird, he loves the weird. <laughs> I love I love the weird, and having a talking duck. Who was kind of this voice uh, piece for Steve Gerber for yeah. like two years? I mean, he he wrote this character, kind of mocking people and making fun of, and became this uh, entertaining outlet for him. But it was his voice, yeah. and so Steve Gerber, you know, those that comic series, I think he did uh, he he did write the majority of them, uh, but he didn't write all of them. And that character since the movie has kind of been adapted to be a little more silly because he shows up in other parts of the Marvel universe. He's in She-Hulk. Oh God, yeah. He's in, in uh, uh squirrel girl. Um, shit. I think I have he's had his own. He, yeah. He's had his own. He's, he's, he's had, had his, his own, own series, series numerous times, but he's mainly been tied to man thing because man thing is the guardian of the nexus of all realities in Florida. And since he's been tied to <laughs> Howard, what? sorry, sorry, that sentence, the nexus of all realities in Florida. In the Florida, influence, yeah. the Florida part <laughs> really got me. Well, it, it explains a, it explains a lot about why Florida explains a Florida lot. Is. Yeah, um, yeah, because people there might have seen talking ducks and stuff. Oh, boy. Uh, of all the places, but, <laughs> yeah. And so he's always been tied to that weird supernatural stuff. But the but for me is I love just seeing Howard and Bev going on adventures, people reacting weirdly to them, not understanding yeah. them. And then just trying to get through it because those aren't the weird people. The weird people are the ones judging them. And that's always kind of been the book and the fun part of it. Um, The magazines are, they have some good stories in them, but a lot of it's just kind of TNA. Yeah. I think I rec. I mean, I would recommend Chip Sadarsky's recent run and I say recent, but it's not that recent. Yeah. It's Uh, 2015, but I think that one's really good. Uh, Ty Templeton did one in 2007. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Howard did have one last Steve Gerber run in uh, 2002. Okay. Um, um, but Chip to Zdarsky's I've never read, but his comedy I don't think is very hateful the way Steve Gerber's is. So no. I can't see it having the same tone. That's why I always see this movie made such an impact because it altered who Howard was. He couldn't be Steve Gerber anymore. Yeah. And he, and he wasn't going to be this angry duck from the comic, but he was just going to be a weird, a weird duck out of place wherever he was. And he I feel the fact how, how accepted he is on earth. He's a fucking walking anamorphic duck. And he's accepted like, ah, oh, it's a duck. Okay, whatever. Well, so it makes you wonder if there actually was, this was the Marvel 616 universe because it's like, okay. <laughs> the movie very smartly does like, they make Howard a likable character immediately when they, when they go through all this stuff in his apartment. Yeah. Like, that the, the accomplishments and he's done all these things and yeah. he's had a crisis where he doesn't want to be a doctor anymore. So he goes and try to do his own thing. And a lot of people can relate to that because, you know, like sometimes you want to follow your creative instincts and, and, that doesn't always pay off, mm-hmm. uh, but but he's always been like he's always a, a a good guy. I feel overall, like you know, he's a little weird and a little horny. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he would be very PC nowadays. He calls you know, broads, I feel like women. To I feel like he's somebody that would adapt though. Like, yeah, he would, yeah, he would, he would adapt with the times because uh, he's he's smart enough for all that stuff. 
and I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the pictures he carries in his wallet. <laughs> <laughs> what would Howard the Duck's Facebook page look like? Oh, oh dear God. I'm going to stay quiet just because of... Now, would he, would he, jo- would he Howard... join Quack? Or would that be what Q would be called in their universe? Quack. Oh, Quack. I don't even want to think about it. Um, <laughs> I do like the explanation at the museum that the evolution of the of duck world. Was so like, explain, it, like, how the hell does he have a fucking a thing of a duck evolving? Like, how long yeah. have you really been thinking about this? Well, yeah. <laughs> so it, that was really funny. So yeah, there's there's a I I, I understand why people like this movie. I, I got I got a quick story for this. It's um like Clay. Uh, I remember I was with uh I think one of my classes. We went to go see uh we you know it was it was a summer daycare. But it was like a second or first or, or first or second grade. And we got to the theater. We were going to see uh, the um, GoBots Battle of the Rock Lords, and so and we were at, and we were at what Ferno Creek Theater, which used to be down here at Old Denton. And uh, oh wow, yeah, yeah. And I remember, and he's like, hey, hey, look under your chairs. If you find a Howard, they were advertising Howard the Duck. If you find a Howard the Duck sticker, you get a T-shirt. So what do I do? I, I didn't see it under mine, so I went to the row ahead of me and found the damn sticker. Everyone's like bitching at me. I'm like, well, what? I found the sticker, so I got a T-shirt for Howard the Duck. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> in a GoBots yeah. film. <laughs> yeah, there, there's not much Howard the Duck uh, merchandise out there, much less no. t-shirts. Yeah. And, yeah, and but you could get those be. back in the day. And see, that was the interesting part is just in Steve Gerber's two-year run, um, he ran for president and got right in votes. I mean, that's... Like actual that, president? Yeah, yeah. That was uh, that was, uh, <laughs> that was was his big thing uh, at one point in the books was uh, uh, the Get Down Party. Um, sure. I think I said that right. Or, yeah, there's a yeah. cover where he's busting through the newspaper saying he wants to be president, right? Yeah, Sometimes yeah. And, and so it was, it was just kind of this bit during uh, 76, and they like sold buttons and made a big thing out of it, and got he got right in votes. So people were reading this, and they, I think I think Howard's a lot bigger with older people just because of that run more than anything else. I think people are familiar because of the movie. And comics fans have a if, different view of him from, uh, I think, 2007 on. If they'd actually have actually did a bigger role in either Guardians or if they'd actually gone ahead and done Kevin Smith's run on uh, Hulu, I think more people would know who he is. But, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I would be curious to see how Kevin Smith would write him. Uh, because I he probably, Knowing Kevin Smith's humor, he probably would have done the character justice. You know what? I think... I. I want to believe that. I want to. I, I really would love if, to if see you, if that. You look at, if you go back to the the view SQ like humor that he does, especially now the fact he's doing Clerks three, I think he probably would have done the character justice. He he is he would be a mixture of Dante and Randall. Yeah. Oh my god. He would right. be he would be he would be a smart mouth, negative. Yeah. Funny dude who just isn't happy where he's at and just can't get out of that funk but found somebody oh yeah that yeah I wow. th- okay yeah i think that that i think if kevin smith's i would love to see it just like i love yeah. seeing his green hornet even though they didn't do a green hornet uh, based on his script i try no but, no, but they, they, they used the script for a comic book which i thought was actually yeah decent. yeah 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 and i read that and i like that i liked yeah. his take on green hornet way better than that well i mean come on, just, just go back on when he did green arrow and daredevil he actually did the characters justice you know it's when yeah i mean okay Aside from people bitching about him with Master of the Universe, that that was a, that was a line that he wa- he wanted to do justice to. He doesn't, that's the, but that's not what he knows. Yeah. But with Tower of the Duck, that's an area where he knows the, it, it's an area that he knows. I think, and especially with his humor, given his past history of films and stuff, I think he would. Yeah, you're right. Howard is Randall mixed with Dante. He's our love yeah. child. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, let me uh, get us shit. back on track. Uh, was, there there any, was there any more? Uh, Cool bits of Howard the Duck goodness. Uh, yeah, I uh, found out that they had started to put together a radio show for Howard the Duck that oh. got canceled during this, and I was like, "No way! Who who was going to voice Howard the Duck?" Anyone Bill Murray. Back? Nope. But you're close. You're in that arena. Dan Aykroyd. Nope. Chevy Chase. Nope. Jim Belushi. That would work. That would have worked for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I I would I would like to hear that. I, I want to hunt down some of these failed uh, projects and see if there's anything out there. I'm sure there's got to be pre-production stuff um, on some of it, at least. I don't know. But I I love this movie. I can't 
you know, I could go on and on about this. Uh, I don't know what Daniel got out of it. How did you feel more connected to the Marvel universe? (laughs) Oh, not at all. Um, (laughs) I would say, like I said, I, I enjoyed a lot of this movie. I can see why people like it. I'll have a, if you follow me on letterbox, I'll do a full review after the show. Uh, Cause I was saving all my notes mainly for the show, but yeah, no, I think we covered everything that I, that I wrote. The, the main thing, my, the thesis of my notes really is who the fuck is this movie for? Yeah. And I think it's people. Well, Clay, tell me. Gloria Cat said, when she was asked that because of the kind of adult content that was in it, who is this for adults or kids? And she just said, anyone that gets the joke. Yeah. Okay. You know, if you enjoy it, that's, that's who it's for. Soft boiled egg supremacy. <laughs> so, and, and, and we, we had uh Howard shown at the Texas theater uh, a couple years ago. Oh yeah. Uh, and Cre- and made it uh, into a giant drinking game for everyone involved that anytime um, it looked like there might be bestiality on the screen, you drink. And oh, so I thought, I'll drink every, you <laughs> I thought it was every time they use some kind of wordplay with the duck. With duck, yeah. yeah that, that's I duck. ducky. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there, there's uh, two documentaries on, uh, on the film. One of them is on YouTube. Uh, I'll link to it in the show notes. Uh, but yeah, I just I, I love Howard and I hope to see more of him. I really love Steve Gerber's uh, take on him. Uh, I yeah. love that kind of comedy more than slapstick and the silliness. Howard the Duck, Sorcerer Supreme. What if? Well, he goes <laughs> in in Duck World to get back to Earth after he realizes everyone in Duck World's a piece of shit, uh, you know, who's using his yeah. name to make money and everything. He goes to uh, Doctor Strange in Duck World to <laughs> open a portal to go back Wait, to is Earth. It, is it Duck Doctor Strange? Doctor Strange. Good. I I'm going to be pulling this and dropping in screenshots of everything that I was reading so that we have a better perception of Doctor Strange and Duck World from that from that oh issue. Oh my god! Cool. Uh, I did I did note as well. Uh, funny that. Two of Leah Thompson's movies end with like this concert where the main character gets a guitar and starts going at it, just like in Back to the Future. Uh, and right after I, another. I was expecting like somebody to be like, "Are you hearing this? I found your new sound." <laughs> <laughs> it's a duck playing the guitar. Well, they did have good people on music, though. I mean, yeah. it, I, I mean George Clinton. You can't argue George Clinton, Thomas Dolby. Yeah. I mean, not, yeah, not related to the Dolby system. No, uh, no, but bl- she blinded me with science. I mean, yeah. Thomas <laughs> Dolby back in the eighties was uh, he was awesome. He rocked. Wait, wait, wait. She what? She blinded me with science. Who? Leah Thompson? No, Thomas oh. Dolby. He wrote that song. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but then I looked at the third person who's listed as a credit uh, on all the music, um, Allie Willis, and I was like, well, what has she ever done? Oh, she wrote the Friends theme. Yeah. <laughs> okay, 10 years later. But <laughs> shit, herself. who doesn't fucking know the Friends theme? Yeah. I know because of the Rembrandt's playing the damn song. I didn't know because she wrote it. <laughs> I know, but still, that's pretty... I mean, if you write a true, song, catchy true, song, that's pretty true. impressive. Yeah. But uh, but to also be associated with Howard the Duck's kind of funny, too. Oh, yeah. John Cusack and Martin Short auditioned to be the voice of Howard the Duck. And then Clay and I were talking before okay. the show. I can, see I, how, see, I can see Martin Short. I see a lot of pictures of uh, Robin Williams. Uh, so mm-hmm. when I was when I was looking through the when I was looking for it for the assets for the yeah. for the shot, there's always anytime you Google Howard the Duck, Robin Williams comes up in in a little bit. Yeah, he was he, he tried to match his voice to the Duck Bill, and he quit after two days. He just said that it was just impossible. It was too constraining, and so they ended up using uh, I think Ed Gale. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he he couldn't do it while he was in the costume. They had done everything to kind of microphone him and get him to do the voice, and they ended up having a puppeteer on set having to do his voice during the movie, and then dub in uh, everything for Howard after it. Oh. So Robin Williams just couldn't work that way. He was just very <laughs> confined in what he could do. So there's a few people that were considered for the role of Beverly in audition. Some some of them auditioned too. Uh, Paul Abdul. 
Kim Basinger. Hashtag not my Beverly. <laughs> no <laughs> shit. Jody Benson, Sarah Michelle, Sarah Jessica Parker, I mean. Oh, oh God, no. 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 Uh, Phoebe Cates audition. Uh, um, no. Uh, Tori Amos. Also I, you know I'm dropping it. Tori Amos? Wait, wait, Tori Tori Amos? Tori Amos? wait, wait, what? Tori Amos auditioned for the part of Beverly Switzer. I love her fucking music, but shit, that would have been different. Yeah, that would have been different. Holy shit! No way. (laughs) Jay Leno was up for the role of Phil Blumbert. Of who? Was that Tim Robbins' character? That's Tim Robbins' character. And yeah, you know that could have maybe worked. No, I don't know about that. Uh, No. Uh, (laughs) Tori Amos. Tori Amos is blowing me away. Oh shit! Fuck, that is weird. Oh, a little detail, a little Easter egg. Uh, yeah, a no kid idea. at the diner scene is wearing a Star Wars Episode Six Return of the Jedi shirt. Uh, that's cool. And then, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so another similarity homage to Back to the Future. When Howard is, is in his recliner and is he going through the portal for a brief moment, you can uh, you can see the, the like the recliner ignites. Kind of like the twin, the the twin streaks that the car leaves behind. Oh, oh yeah, the DeLorean. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I don't know. I like I said, I enjoyed the movie. I'm glad I I finally watched it. Well, um, it's fun. watching a lot of places for free. I was watching a. Yeah, I, it's on the, Pluto uh, for free. It's I looked on oh Pluto. It's also on Peacock. Yeah, I watched free. it on Peacock. You get you you have to watch like two minutes of ads before, but then there's no ads throughout the whole movie. That works. Uh, so yeah, I'm good with that. Uh, so. I just put it on Disney Plus. Damn it! White man <laughs> is a blackjack dealer. Just a super job, kids. Charles and Madge, come on, let's hear it for him, folks.
and let's get out of let's here. Let's ride. <laughs> Thanks everyone for watching. Well, I love you. Oh yeah. <laughs> Clay. Hail Bebo. Josh. Uh, uh, Simon Sander, get the fuck out. <laughs> 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 All right, bye. All right. Yeah. I've got it now. <laughs>